Hey, it's Dr. Darren Schmidt. So I made a video a few weeks ago regarding my office manager and her husband, and they started the carnivore diet at the beginning of June of 2022. And within six weeks, they had some phenomenal results. And I can post a video right here at the top of this page. And the a vegan picked up on this and made uh, like a critique video, if you will. So I'm going to go over his video and I'll have some responses. Okay, this is going to be really good. So are you ready? Here we go. Plants have oxalates, phytates, salicylates. They have lectins. You've heard of gluten. These are all poisons. Hey, this is Ryan of Happy Healthy Vegan. So once again, one of our loyal viewers wrote to us to have me check out a video to respond to, a video made by a, a YouTube chiropractor I've never heard of before, Dr. Darren Schmidt. I want to point out he's a doctor of chiropractic. I just need to say there's no such word as chiropractory. Uh, the word is chiropractic. Not a medical doctor. And I'm not here to criticize him or throw hate at him. That's not how we roll here on Happy Healthy Vegan. I will not attack the person as usual. I will look at their arguments and the information they present and present objective evidence-based response. Okay, we're off to a good start in that he's not attacking me as a person. He's going to go after some of the ideas, the things that I say, which is perfectly fine. Um, in previous uh, experiences with vegans um, coming after my information, they go after me as a human being. And uh, Ryan, I've seen you for years and I like to watch a lot of um, healthcare related videos, whether it's um, a diet or supplement or drug or the latest thing in the news. I watch all kinds of uh, people and their information. So um, even though you said you've not heard of me ever before, I've known of you for probably five or more years. Okay, so let's see what he has to say here about plants being poisons. I have a patient who made a huge change with her diet about six weeks ago. And uh, here's the story. It's pretty amazing. Really severe allergies around her eyes and nose, eyes turning red, plus body pain, such as back pain. And she's been trying to lose weight. So she's been keto. She's been fasting. Uh, and I've done all these uh, supplements for her. Her husband, high blood pressure, 170 over 110. We're talking all these years. Yes, all these years of eating all sorts of foods, including plants, but not limited to just plants. So when you mention all these foods, including plants, but not just limited to plants, are you referring to processed food, for example, uh, junk food, pop? No, they don't eat processed food. They don't eat junk food. They cook at home and their diet, and I've known them for 10 years, their diet has been plants and animals and then water and fasting. Like their diet's been very simple this whole time. No junk food, no chips. Um, they have, would have some mixed nuts as snacks, but that's keto, that's low carb. And so don't assume that these uh, two people have, had, have been eating bad food. And six weeks ago, they bought a course on the carnivore diet. Her allergies are gone. Her body pain is 70% better and she's lost 16 pounds. His blood pressure is now 120 over 80. Well, their version is no plants in any form, in any way. No salads, no vegetables, no avocado oil, no olive oil, no coconut oil. They're using tallow and they're eating meat, water, salt, and that's it. So you can already see the extreme shade being thrown at plants here for being responsible for all these symptoms because his patients followed an elimination diet, eliminated every last food out of their diet except for one thing, meat. And I'm sure when they eliminated plants, they eliminated other things too, if they're having, say, processed foods and what have you, you know? No, they had no processed food and no what have you. There's no other foods. They've been my patients for nine or 10 years. And she's been my employee as my office manager. And she's, she's been following my recommendations this whole time. So her elimination diet eliminated plants in all forms. And that was the simplicity of it. But it's the plants that were undoubtedly responsible for these symptoms. And now they have gone away because they're eating just one food meat. I just want to show you that's the, the critical thinking being employed here. Yes, it was undoubtedly the plants. There was nothing else. And I don't want to beat a dead horse, but 
that's all that they eliminated was the plants. There was no other types of foods that they were eating. And so therefore it was the plants causing these disease conditions. Continue on. What are the foods that were bad for you that you stopped? And here's her answer. Carrots, asparagus, broccoli, cauliflower, cucumbers, Brussels sprouts. These are the foods that were causing her inflammation, allergies, inability to lose weight, and body pain. I find this really hard to believe that prior to her elimination diet, her carnivore diet, she was eating meat, plus these like handful of vegetables, which she eliminated and she can pinpoint them as the cause. Like I said, I'm sure there are many other foods that she eliminated besides. All right. For the fourth time, there were no other foods. They've been very compliant with all my recommendations for 10 years. Now you can go online and search the term anti-nutrient and then the name of the plant. So type in anti-nutrient cabbage, anti-nutrient cucumber, et cetera, anti-nutrient, pick the name of the plant and you'll see the types of nutrients that are against your body, that are not nutritious, they're poisonous. The plants are trying to defend themselves. They can't run away from you. They can't hit you or bite you, uh, but they can poison you. So it totally makes sense. And it's, it's genetic. And there are people who they can't handle these poisons. And there are other people that can handle these poisons. It, it's all determined on a one-to-one -one basis. It's carrots and Brussels sprouts. And another reason why I find this a bit hard to believe is that these foods that she's eliminating, as he said here, to improve her inflammation are actually anti-inflammatory. For instance, the first food he mentioned was carrots. And if you just do a casual search about inflammation in carrots, yeah, you'll find that there is a, a connection, but not in the way that this chiropractor doctor is implying here. It's actually quite the opposite. The vitamin A and beta carotene in carrots are believed to actually help fight inflammation. Okay. First of all, there's no vitamin A in carrots. There's only beta carotene. That is not vitamin A. You can only find vitamin A in animal foods. Secondly, that's one part of the carrot, beta carotene. There are hundreds, if not thousands of other chemicals in carrots. So just because some scientist in a lab discovered beta carotene in carrots and says, oh, look, this is anti-inflammatory, doesn't mean that the whole carrot itself is safe for you to eat or cucumber or Brussels sprouts or asparagus because it's a complex of nutrients in these plants. And that's the problem with modern science is the reductionism where they're taking out this one chemical and they're saying that this chemical does a thing to the body, but they're not incorporating all the chemicals in that food. And this started, you know, prior to 19 or after 1911. So just because beta carotene in a carrot may help you, it doesn't mean that there's two dozen other chemicals in the food that doesn't help you and can cause harm. And carrots do have oxalates and salicylates. These are two chemicals that can cause harm based on your genetics and also based on the overall state of your health. And if your health is poor, then maybe your body will have a harder time with those two chemicals. And the same goes for these other foods that the doctor's picking on here, like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Both broccoli and Brussels sprouts have glucosinolates, and these are goitrogens. They're harmful to your thyroid. So if you have a poor functioning thyroid, you have to avoid these types of foods. So again, type in the word anti-nutrient plus the name of the food and see what comes up. Again, just, if you just do a basic search of foods that cause inflammation, you're not going to find any of these foods on there. But foods you will find are foods that are common in most people's diets. So if you're on an elimination diet and you get rid of Brussels sprouts, carrots, and broccoli, but you also get rid of seed oils, and you also get rid of processed meats, maybe one of those two known inflammatory foods that you eliminated were responsible for your symptom. They had stopped seed oils years ago and processed meats more than 10 years ago. Anyway, let's look at his second example here, which is a personal thing that he did. So let's just check it out. It involves Outback Steakhouse. This is a wild story. Okay, this isn't a wild story at all. I was at Outback Steakhouse. I had a steak and I was feeling fine. And my friend had Brussels sprouts. I had four or five of them and I started burping. Like that's not wild at all. You can't, it's not hard to imagine. 
that Brussels sprouts can cause burping. I mean, are there other plants that cause burping and gas? Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, beans. Have you heard of plants causing gas burping? So it's a boring story. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let you sit there for another minute and a half and listen to the story. And I'm burping. And I told him, I'm burping because of those plants. Okay, as a longtime Brussels sprout eater here, I gotta jump in and say. Burping, at least for me, is not a normal reaction to having Brussels sprouts. I'm not sure what's going on with him. Maybe all this fasting and eating steak predominantly. He doesn't have a proper gut microbiome to process Brussels sprouts. Just speculating here, but that's not normal. That's something to do with him. And that's a true statement. It does have something to do with me. And every person needs to be addressed uh, individually for what is the best diet for them. And we're going to get into lab work soon, and you'll see the difference between these two diets, the diet I have and the diet that Ryan has. I'd rather take the burping than the other detrimental effects of the other diet. And it's not even completely clear that the Brussels sprouts cause the burping. He's just asserting that. Like, How could it not be the Brussels sprouts? I mean, I had a steak, water, and Brussels sprouts. And after the steak, I sat there, I waited for my friend to finish his food. You know, minutes had gone by, I was totally fine. And I put those Brussels sprouts in my mouth, I swallowed them down and started burping. Like it's simple, it's cause and effect. I know a lot of people can't think in terms of cause and effect, like A causes B. And it has to do with the timeline, you know, like the, I call it the timeline history. If something happened at this point, what happened just before that point that may have caused it? So this is, you know, it's logical. It's easy to, if you can think straight, you can realize that, yeah, you know, the Brussels sprouts maybe start to burp. Like, and it tasted like Brussels sprouts, like Jesus Pete's. How did he investigate that? It's the plants that are causing the symptom. It wasn't 22 ounces of meat. Meat is innocent. Indeed, the animal that was slaughtered needlessly so you could consume your 22 ounce steak was innocent. Okay, there you twisted my words. I'm calling you out for not understanding English very well. Meat is innocent in that it doesn't cause disease. There's no study, I'm sorry, there's no clinical trial or scientific experiment that shows that meat causes any disease. Now, vegans and public health officials and nutritionists and dietitians and professors and all the people that promote uh, a low-fat diet, low-animal meat diet, say that disease is caused by meat. Meat causes disease, but that's not a true statement. And they're relying on surveys. And I've said this before, I've been saying this for four years. Epidemiology is 95% of nutrition research and it's a survey. And there's two questions, how's your health and how's your diet? And people say, my health is whatever and my diet is whatever. And they try to recall what their diet is and then you put these answers into an Excel spreadsheet. You do some math to it. It looks like science, but it's not because you never did a study or a scientific experiment to the person with a control group. Okay. So I've been looking since 2017 for the science that shows that meat causes disease. And I found none. So 2017, that's five years. And this is my profession. And I'm studying every day. And I've clicked on all the links that all the vegans gave me, and I don't find the science that shows that meat causes disease. So yes, meat is innocent, and it does not cause disease. Stick with me on the rest of this video, please. It gets better. It had no right to be exploited its entire life and slaughtered so you could eat a piece of steak when you could have had perfectly healthy plant options. Yes, I like this. Let's make a bumper sticker. So he does have a point that that cow was slaughtered for my sake, half of that cow in my freezer. It may take me a year to eat that cow. I started with the ground beef, then the steaks, now I'm on the roasts. I'd rather kill one cow for a year than the thousands and thousands of animals it takes to grow your pea protein powder or the soybean tofu, whatever that you eat. And I grew up on a commercial farm and I know what I'm talking about. We had 750 acres and it was sterile. We had creeks that were, had no fish. We had, there was no turtles. We grew sweet corn and the birds came in 
and you had to shoot the birds and they would fly away. They'd be gone for 30 minutes. They'd come back. You shoot the next bird and then they'd fly away and they'd come back in 30 minutes. We had a barn with equipment stored on the bottom floor and the bats on the roof would poop on the equipment. We shot all the bats. We killed them all so that the equipment wouldn't get poop all over it. We're killing bats, birds, insects, turtles, rabbits, coyotes, deer, you name it. The thousands and thousands of animals that are sacrificed so that you can drive a plow over 750 acres and then you plant and then you spray 13 times throughout the season and all that runoff. Don't get me started on this. There's no way that you can be a vegan and think that you're doing it for the animals or for the planet. It is the most destructive uh, activity that you can do is to monoculture plants and then sell it to the populace. This is exactly what Bill Gates is trying to do. He's got 275 million acres and he's pushing Beyond Meat and Impossible Burgers. And if you're on his team, you're on Team Globalist. You're on Team uh, Monoculture, uh, Big Ag, uh, Federal Subsidies, and um, you're on the wrong team. If you, and, and, it's, and, and if you believe that global warming is caused by human activity, then you want to buy a cow that was raised one mile from your house, which is my cow. It was raised one mile from my house, incorporating regenerative farming. And if we had half of the beef production was on soil that was regeneratively farmed, that would sequester all the carbon. And this global warming thing, if you believed in it, would be over. But that's the opposite of what the government wants to do and all the minions that are on Bill Gates' side and the vegan side, the heavy industrial food side, the processed food side. That's not, they don't want regenerative agriculture. They want monoculture. They want to strip the land. They want to kill all the animals. They don't want any bugs. They don't want any insects. They don't want any uh, possible damage to their crops. They're going to wipe out all the animals. I lived this in 17 summers, starting at the age of nine. I worked on this farm. Not once did I see a deer. And that location has very few human beings. It, there's a lot of agriculture where I grew up. And then as an adult, I moved into Ann Arbor and there's literally deer within the city limits. There was deer in my backyard. I was one mile from downtown Ann Arbor and I had deer in my backyard. And you would think that being out in agricultural space where I was raised, that there, there'd be plenty of deer. No, it's totally sterile. If we were to implement regenerative practices on just 50% of those row crop and grazing acres, we would be able to pretty much eradicate our climate issue, our greenhouse gas emissions issue here in North America with just 50% of the agricultural acres. So one year of eating half a cow is one cow dead. One year of eating pea plant protein and soybean protein is literally thousands of animals dead. Plants have oxalates, phytates, salicylates. They have lectins. You've heard of gluten. These are all poisons. So now we're to the most outrageous thing he said in this video, the most fact challenge thing that plants are all full of poisons. And this is just completely easily disproven just um, without getting into, into any of the science, which we will in a second here. Let's examine why I'm not sick and nearly dead after having been vegan for 11 and a half years, eating only plants, tons of these vegetables on his naughty list and have healthy, great blood tests. I'm athletic. I'm about to turn 55 guys in a, in a few days. I think I'm doing pretty well for a dude my age. So um, if I've been eating exclusively poisons for 11 years, how long is it going to take for these horrible things to happen? Like uh, what he's ever talking about, the inflammation and, and worse since they're poisons. But anyway, let's... In preparation for this rebuttal video, I went to the dentist and I got my blood drawn. We're going to compare my health. I'm 50. With Ryan's health, he's 55. Are you ready? Found out this morning that that bottom left molar 
needs to be yanked out. Yeah, so two weeks. So I just went to the dentist five days ago and I have no bad teeth, no cavities. I've never had a tooth pulled. I've never had an infected tooth. I've never had a cavitation. I don't have gum recession. I have no problems with my teeth whatsoever. And in the last 20 years, I've been to the dentist three times. The last time I went was six years ago. Prior to that, it was 10 years ago. Why would I go to the dentist when I'm eating a low carb diet since 1999? The reason why people get cavities and tooth problems is from an infection caused by a high carb diet and eating poisonous food and smoking, which is very poisonous to the mouth. So as I, as I was talking to the dental hygienist, I told her I'm on the carnivore diet and she's pretty new in the profession. I don't know when she graduated, but she's young. And she goes, oh yeah, in school, they taught us that people on the carnivore diet have way less cavities. They had professors talk about it. She had nutrition class and she said they had people coming from outside of the dental school in as guest lecturers. And everyone agrees that people on the carnivore diet have less cavities. When you have an infected tooth, I mean, that's bone, that's blood, that's tissue. That's a very destructive process happening in your head. Like if you have a bad tooth, there's something really, really wrong going on with the physiology of your body, your immune system, your circulation, the oral microbiome, other things. So it's a bad sign to have a bad tooth. So the one real surprise was my LDL cholesterol was 110. It should be below 100. It should be well below that as a vegan. And the only issue uh, my doctor wanted to point out was my um, triglyceride levels. First of all, my cholesterol levels, you know, they're going to smash it because I don't eat any animal products. Your HDL cholesterol is too low at 47. Mine's 20 points higher. Your triglycerides are way too high at 164. And I've compiled my lab tests for the last 20 years. And my triglycerides are below 70 every time I've had that tested. But what's high also is your VLDL. So VLDL stands for very low density lipoprotein. And it's a measurement of how total LDL and HDL are related to each other. They need to be in balance. They can all be high but as long as they're in balance in relationship to each other, it's fine. Your VLDL needs to be less than 19 and yours is 33. I took your total cholesterol minus HDL minus LDL and it's 33 and it needs to be less than 19. So your lipids are way off. Uh, my triglycerides were a tiny bit elevated, a little bit above. They want you to be um, uh, below 150. So you have to go on a low carb diet in order to lower your VLDL. And there's only one thing that can raise HDL and that is animal fat. And that's in the science, it's in the research. So only animal fat can raise HDL, the healthy, so-called healthy lipoprotein. The one surprise for me, well, not too big because last year it was 109. My LDL, my bad cholesterol went up to 129, which got it flagged as being outside the reference interval. LDL, I'm not even concerned about that. It's more about the VLDL, raising HDL, uh, lowering VLDL, and keeping that triglycerides below, you know, easily below 100. It should be more like 70. And when you go on a low carb diet, that's the first thing that drops is the triglycerides. And then the LDL has to carry the triglycerides out of the fat and into the muscle. So when you go on a low carb diet, up comes the triglycerides, and then the body makes more LDL as a bus to carry the triglycerides. So as long as your LDL is not made from sugar, and as long as your total cholesterol is not made from sugar, then you're fine, right? Sugar destroys your fat. Sugar makes your fat um, dense and heavy and sick and oxidized. And when you eat no sugar, you're, you're on a low carb diet, then your um, fats, your LDL, for example, is fluffy. And, and light and not oxidized. So the quality of the cholesterol matters and the source of the cholesterol matters. So eating animal fats gives you the light, fluffy, non-oxidized, healthy fats. Few days, I think I'm doing pretty well for a dude my age. So um, if I've been eating exclusively poisons for 11 years, how long is it gonna take for these horrible things to happen? Like 
I just showed you it's already happened. In preparation for this video, I put together 20 years of my blood tests. And you can see from 2002 to 2012, my cholesterol has never been over 200. The highest it's been is 199. My LDL ranged from 66 to 113. Totally acceptable because my HDL is high, um, averaging in the 60s, um, mid 60s or so. My VLDL has been below 14 um, this whole time, 20 years. That, again, that's the most important number. My triglycerides have never been over 70. Like that speaks volumes in metabolic health. You know, only 8% of Americans have good metabolic health. And I can say that I'm one of them and I'm in and out of ketosis. This is very important to do to kill off cancer cells, uh, pathogenic tissue, cysts, fibroids, skin tags, uh, reverse aging, kill off uh, old cells that ha are hanging around for too long. And then I have uh, three reports of my A1C at the bottom of this graph. Uh, 5.1, 5 5.4, and the other one was 5.3. Um, I put 89 in that one, but it's 5.3. So you want your A1C to be 5.4 or below. And if somebody's at 5.7 or 5.9, they're, they're called pre-diabetic. I disagree with that. I think it's diabetic. And um, I have a patient who told me just the other day that his doctor says his A1C is 7.0, and that's normal, that's good. I was like, no, that's diabetic. You're going to wipe out your kidneys. You're going to get gangrene in your feet. And he's eating pretty low carb, but he's got alcohol. He drinks beer every, every night. So um, get your A1C at 5.4 or below by eating a low carb diet. This is vital. And then all these other numbers get better. It's the sugar that makes your lipids go haywire, right? So sugar comes first, lipids come second. Let's look at some of the, the actual evidence that shows that plants aren't poisons. Like many anti-vegans do, he mentioned phytates and lectins, amongst other things. We'll get to oxalates and stuff in a second, but let's look at what the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health says about these supposed anti-nutrients. So reading through this anti-nutrients page on the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health website, we see here the information about phytates and lectins, which are found in legumes. And this is one reason why a lot of anti-vegans dislike legumes because of these horrible anti-nutrients found in them that are going to wreck our health and cause all these horrible problems. And you'll see these fears are just based on nonsense. And listening to Harvard here, rather than some like you know, just random person on the internet. This is called appeal to authority. It's a way to argue. And you're basically saying that there are people who are more important, smarter, or have more um, clout than the person you're arguing against. So the Harvard T. Chan Public School or School of Public Health, um, they're the ones that were bribed by the sugar industry to promote sugar as a health food. They're the ones that caved to Ansel Keys to, in order to attack fat, animal fat. At first it was all fat. And then for some reason, Mediterranean fat was okay. Olive, fat was, olive oil fat was okay. And uh, so the Harvard School of Public Health is, and all the schools of public health, they all have it wrong. So don't use appeal to authority and throw out the word Harvard three times. Harvard says that these anti-nutrients, the lectins and phytates and legumes are deactivated once you either soak or boil. That's not true because you can soak, boil, and prepare your plants in such way to reduce the amount of these um, poisonous chemicals. And, it's so, and here you are admitting that they are a problem. And then you have to process them. But there are people who still can't eat those foods even after they process them. And you can look up the amount of processing it takes in order to reduce these plant chemicals by a certain percentage. So if you cook a food for 10 minutes, let's say cauliflower, for example, they know how much of that poison is still left in there. So it's up to you, right? Like if you want to eat these foods, go right ahead. Um, but, you know, you don't want to be sick because then other people have to take, take care of you financially or maybe even, you know, like personally. So it's your responsibility to be healthy. It's not your responsibility to follow a diet, right? Your responsibility is the end result. It's not the process. The process, you got to figure out what will give you a healthy body in the long run. And it's not just, you know, doing a thing. It's getting a result. 
And of course, he brought up oxalates as one of these poisons in foods. And it just so happens about a year, year and a half ago, I made a video on oxalates after an anti-vegan was coming to my live streams, hassling me about how I'm poisoning myself and my viewers by eating foods that contain oxalates. So I've had several patients where I told them to stop eating spinach because spinach has more oxalates than any other food and it double the number two food. I forgot what the second food is, but spinach is number one and it's double number two. And people have had amazing results by stopping spinach. Migraines gone, chest pain gone, uh, endurance while running improved. Um, of course, you can have oxalate digestive problems and then you're one of the bigger symptoms um, that's not very common, but it's a sandy bowel movements. And the, it comes out like sand, it's got the color of it and the consistency of it. So there's a lot of symptoms that you can get from eating spinach and, um, and you can boil them. And guess what? Oxalates are still in the spinach. The plants have these chemicals in order to punish you for eating their stems, leaves, roots, tubers. That's the plant. I mean, this is complete nonsense that plants are somehow punishing us for eating them. I'm just so punished here, 11 and a half years vegan, eating all these anti-nutrients that aren't doing jack crap bad to me. And if you really want to point out foods that punish those who eat them, look no further than your, your steak there and processed meat for that matter, which I don't think he's too into, but let's look at his steak there. It's a known carcinogen, a group 2A carcinogen, and processed meat, a group 1 carcinogen. And I'm asking the uh, doctor here, the chiropractor, can you point out any plants on your naughty list that are known by the World Health Organization? Regarding the WHO claiming that meat causes cancer, that report was debunked by Dr. Georgia Ede. And guess what? She's from Harvard. And she's a practicing doctor there, medical doctor, appeal to authority. And she debunks this report by the WHO. And she says it is not a scientific article, it is a political article. And there's no clinical trial in this report by the WHO where they experiment on people and meat. They use mice, they use surveys. And when they, when they actually use mice, they poison the mice first. And then they added a whole bunch of chemicals way higher than what any human would ever eat. So meat does not cause cancer. And the who is wrong to say that meat causes cancer. I'll put the link below so that you can read her report and you can read the who report and verify that what she's saying is correct. Since we're talking about the wonderful Dr. George Ede from Harvard, let me share with you uh, a quick snippet of a video that she did. And it's absolutely fascinating. She went through PubMed, all the medical research, and she's trying to find out, do vegetables benefit the human body in its health? So here's what she has to say about this. So just as an experiment, I wanted to, to get a feel for what kinds of evidence is out there supporting vegetables and health. And so what I did was I went on PubMed, and which is a search engine for those of you who don't know, the signs of gargles, and um, uh, there are over 80,000 studies about vegetables, so I obviously couldn't go through all of those, uh, narrowed them down to, the, to uh, randomized controlled studies having to do with vegetables and health. And I used the word health because if anything, that might induce a positive bias. It's looking for evidence to support vegetables. And so unfortunately, most of these studies I, I had to eliminate uh, from, from the consideration because most of them were irrelevant to the question. The vast majority of studies about vegetables were about how to get people to eat more of them, not about whether or not they were actually healthy. So, and of the studies that remained, 18 of them were negative. The investigators were looking for health benefits from vegetables and didn't find what they were hoping to see. And as you might notice here, uh, the, another problem with vegetable studies is that the vast majority of vegetable studies are not studies of vegetables, they're studies of fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables are very different uh, from a plant point of view and from our point of view. They're, they're just completely different creatures. So hard to say. So in the positive studies, I found 10 positive studies, but unfortunately none of them controlled for refined carbohydrates. It's very hard to say whether or not the health benefits that the investigators claimed were due to the vegetables 
were due to the vegetables or whether they were due to the fact that the people who were eating more fruits and vegetables were eating less refined carbohydrates. And, and 10 other positive studies, unfortunately, manipulated more than one variable. So they didn't just add more vegetables to people's diets. They also happened to reduce sodium or reduce saturated fat or um, add exercise, et cetera. So it's just hard to tell which part of the diet was or, or the intervention was responsible for the health benefit. I'm not saying that the vegetables couldn't have been responsible because they could have been. We just can't tell because of the way the studies were designed. So what Dr. Ede is saying is that there's 20 studies that are poorly done with confounding variables and um, not controlling for fruits or even refined grains showing that vegetables are healthy, but you can't even come to that conclusion because the scientific procedure uh, was not rigorous enough. And then there are 18 studies showing that vegetables were not good, but then they were also um, including fruits. Some of them included fruits. So I would just like to ask, where's the studies that show that vegetables alone are beneficial for the human body? Not a survey, not epidemiology, not a cohort study, it's got to be a clinical trial, an experiment. It's got to be science where you do something to a group of people and then you compare that with a control group. So it doesn't exist. And I'm asking the uh, doctor here, the chiropractor, can you point out any plants on your naughty list that are known by the World Health Organization to be carcinogens? No. No, the World Health Organization is a political body. Uh, IARC, that's the subcommittee within the World Health Organization, and they're run by vegans. So no, they'll never say that there are plants that cause disease. All you can do is put out this fantasy story how plants are punishing people for eating them. No, you got it backwards. Meat is literally punishing people being an inherent carcinogen. All right, let's talk about that statement at the bottom of the video screen right there. It said the word association. It's important to know that they are grammatically and scientifically and technically correct to say that there is an association between meat consumption and stomach cancer and pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer. Association, again, comes from epidemiology. That's a survey. That is not a scientific statement. Now, there, there is science to back up the health benefits of eating meat. And there is science to show that meat does not cause these cancers. So you can pick and choose the type of studies that you want to look at. Um, Brian here is looking at surveys, not science. I look at science and there's plenty of books and um, referenced very well that you can look at and you can read and you can determine on your own. So the vegans will often say this term, they'll say the preponderance of science or the weight of the science. And they're just saying that all research is equal and 95% of science is survey, right, which is in science, but it's 95% of the research in PubMed regarding nutrition. But not all science is, not all research is the same. It's only that very small percent that's a clinical trial or randomized clinical trial, right? And if you, you can do one clinical trial that shows truth and it wipes out a thousand surveys and makes them all incorrect. If you are into health, you have to read this book, The Big Fat Surprise. Half of this book is the references, the scientific articles that back, that back up everything that Nina Teichel says. This book, highly scientific, Gary Tobbs is a rocket scientist and journalist, heavily referenced. This is science. And as a side note, what's interesting is that the epidemiology of the 1930s was actually well done and ethical. And it wasn't just Weston A. Price, but it was a variety of other um, explorers, and um, they were all saw the degradation of the foods of modern society back in the 30s and 20s, and they went looking at the tribes and what they ate, and they all came to the same conclusion that meat was beneficial and that the processed food that came from factories and from modern commerce was detrimental. But after Ansel Keys came on the scene in the 1950s, the explorers who looked at pockets of indigenous tribes, they didn't get the same answers as these people did. And they said that it's the plants that are the most important factors 
and that has been picked apart and critiqued uh, to death. I have stated this for several years that the research and the science and the medical community prior to World War II was ethical. After World War II, it became unethical. So that's why I study a lot of books prior to World War II. A plug for this book, Ravenous, Otto Warburg, The Nazis, and the search for the cancer diet connection. They knew that sugar was the cause of cancer. Prior to 1913, they also knew that it drove cancer, right? And people were eating meat back then, but they knew, they saw, they saw the difference. It's not meat causing cancer. It never was. And to be absolutely clear for anyone new who's watching, the reason why I'm vegan is because it's completely unnecessary to exploit and slaughter animals so I could go on living because it's been shown by health organizations around the world, their position papers on the subject that completely meat-free and vegan diets are nutritionally adequate for all people in all stages of life. So, yeah, this is another appeal to authority. So what? There's a whole bunch of associations that look at epidemiology and they come to the wrong conclusion. The top meta-researcher, his name is John Yonides. He studies science. He studies studies. He studies professions. He studies the researchers and what they do. And what they, are they doing? Is it correct? Does it give us answers or not? This is what he said. Exploratory epidemiology has a, the chance of giving you fact, the chance is one in 10,000. So things like the China study, not science. There's so many surveys. The, the chance of getting, I'm gonna say it again, the chance of getting a fact that's truthful is one in 10,000. That's why you have to do a clinical trial. Now we're talking one in three, a randomized clinical trial, one in two. So I did a video about this several years ago, I can post it right here, maybe. It's a win, win, win. It's a win for the animals. You're not needlessly killing living sentient beings every day in order to continue existing. It's perfectly healthy as long as you don't do anything ridiculous, as long as it's a perfectly planned vegan diet. Back in 2017, I did a video that I'm super proud of, and I mentioned Dr. Greger and Dr. McDougall, who are two vegans. And um, I got uh, found out or discovered by the vegans, and I had to put up with that for, no, for about a year. And they came at me, they attacked me, they attacked my ad hominem attacks. They attacked me as a person instead of attacking the ideas. And uh, some of them gave me links, uh, videos to watch, research articles to read. And I looked at all of the things that they gave me. I read, I read Dr. Atkins um, death certificate that, that was sent to me. And I just caught all the lies. At the time, I wasn't asking for vegan patients, but I got a lot of vegan patients. And I got some people that you might know the name of if I said their name. And I'm telling you, every single one of them cheated on the diet. There was not one vegan that didn't eat meat at least twice a year. And the stories that I heard, I couldn't believe it. There's a facade going on right here. I got a friend named Monica Hershaft, and she was interviewed by Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof Coffee guy. Monica's father started the modern vegan movement when she was a very young girl and it started in her living room and his name is Alex Hershaft and he they flat out say veganism is not about health. Now Alex Hershaft was a young kid in Auschwitz in the concentration camp and he survived it. Now fast forward to the 1970s his, he's in the United States he's working for the federal government and he's inspecting a pork factory a pork production facility and just picture pork, you know, bodies, pig bodies stacked up, pink skin. And he had a, he got triggered a flashback to Auschwitz, looking at dead pink bodies on the floor of this pork processing factory. And he made a decision at that moment. It was so distressing to him because of his Auschwitz experience. He made the decision to never let it happen again. And what does that mean? In my estimation, it would be stop socialism because it was the National Socialist Workers Party of 1930s Germany that started World War II and the concentration camps. But that's not how he thought. In his mind, it was stop eating meat, never let it happen again. So the, the, the logic it didn't settle at that moment. So one day I was with Monica, we're driving around Los Angeles together. That's where she was living at the time. 
and there was a billboard with an athlete kissing a shoe. Now, this athlete had a tattoo on his face, just like Mike Tyson had a new tattoo on his face at the time. And he's kissing a shoe and the billboard said, I'm vegan for the animals or something like that. And I was dumbfounded. I was like, and I said to Monica, so wait a minute, in Los Angeles, you actually have billboards promoting veganism. And she said, yeah, that's my dad. His foundation funded that billboard. I was like, oh my gosh. So that push comes from an illogical response to seeing pigs slaughtered on a floor. But then I went to the hotel and I said, you guys must hate this conference. It's a big conference, thousands of people. So you must hate this conference because no one will order your room service, right? And they started laughing and they said, no, no, no. This is our biggest conference ever of the year for room service orders. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, everyone just orders chicken and all the other normal food up in the rooms and they eat all the vegan stuff down here and literally highest revenue. So there's a lot of people who want to be vegan because they believe something, but their body won't let them. Guys, I hope I wasn't too mean on the chiropractor doctor here. I get a little emotional sometimes. I'm very passionate about what I do, but I didn't mean to do any personal attacks. So please don't leave any hate or negative comments on his video or on any of his videos. It's Let's be cool. Let's not get vegans a bad image here. So it's very important that he say that to calm down his audience. Um, my experiences have been a disaster with vegans. They've attacked me on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and uh, gave me a whole bunch of one-star reviews on Facebook. In 2017, I mentioned that I was discovered by the vegans. I had to delete or ban like three people a week off of the channel. So I have about 400 vegans that I've banned off of my YouTube channel because they're just so nasty. And uh, vegans have the highest rate of mental health problems than any other dietary group. In this study, the doctor says there's a baffling link between vegetarianism and depression. How is that baffling at all? It totally makes sense. So we can just look at this graphic right here. It says incidence of depressive disorders. The green um, bar graph is vegetarian. And the yellow is semi, and then red is non-vegetarian. Completely makes sense to me. In this graphic right here, we have vegetarians who have the highest amount of depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, somatoform disorder, and eating disorder compared to semi-vegetarians and non-vegetarians. -veg Every time that I was attacked by vegans, I was able to flip that around and send out an email to my patient base and say, hey, look, the vegans found me again. Uh, they gave me a whole bunch of one-star reviews, or they're doing this, they're doing that. I need you to counter that by giving me five star reviews and then i contact uh, facebook and they took down a whole bunch of the fake reviews so i can put up with it and they actually make it turn into a good thing for my business so if you're a vegan and you think you want to attack me don't do it it'll just help me it'll attract more people to me it'll push more people away from your movement so be nice be friendly and um you know there's that running joke like if you're pissed off as you're listening to my words right now it means you need a double cheeseburger. Uh, you can take the bun off, keep it low carb, and uh, put some pickles on there for the fermented probiotics. But um, if you are feeling this, those um, emotions right now of anger because of my words, then I'm talking to you. That means that you need to do something different about your diet for your mental health, your brain health, your B vitamin uh, stores, and uh, the functioning of your body. I, tr I was a vegetarian, mostly vegan for a year and a half. I was depressed. I was complaining all the time. Back in 1995, 96, my hair was falling out. I couldn't get out of bed. It was a disaster. It was horrible. And if, and if the, you want to respond, Dr. Schmidt, um, I'd be more than happy to entertain you on one of my live streams. So thanks for the offer, but I don't really want to be on your live stream. I think you did a great job. You didn't do, attack me personally. And that's why I'm responding. So, but I appreciate that you opened up this discussion and I hope that I presented enough material and information and resources to get people to understand that I, I know a lot of facts about the diets. This is my career. I, I've been studying what I call hardcore holistic nutrition since 1993. And I've been through every diet. I've been low carb since 99, ketogenic since 2015 and carnivore diet since 2018. And my health has continuously improved and with the knowledge I have, um, I was exposed to black mold unknowingly and uh, almost I, I was thinking I was going to die in 2016, but I didn't. I got the supplements and um, that saved my life.
my diagnosis uh, was uh, at, um, invasive aspergillosis, which has a 50% mortality rate. It really affected my heart negatively, and there's no diet that can fix that. But I want to show you that I study plants and I sell plants in the form of supplements and herbs. And I do recommend some foods for that plant based food for some people. And we talk about diets depending on what people need and want. And I want to show you a book, Principles and Practice of Phytotherapy. It's a large textbook and it talks about herbal medicine and the secondary metabolites that plants produce. That is medicine. So you have a plant that's made out of uh, primary constituents that's wood, you know, bark, uh, chlorophyll, fiber. That's the plant itself, the leaves, the stem, the roots. The plant then makes chemicals in order to survive well where it is. So it could be a dry air area, it could be very humid. It could, they need to attract pollinators. They need to have defense mechanisms. These are called secondary metabolites. These chemicals are medicine. And I carry hundreds of herbal and nutritional supplement products that have plants in them. And I'm not searching for plants as food. I'm looking at plants as medicine. And I study this for a long time. I got just a million books about this, uh, this concept. And these are some of my favorite books and, you know, various catalogs from nutritional supplement companies. You know, they got the plants right on the cover. Look, there's plants right on the cover. Look, there's plants right on the cover. So I'm not anti-plant. I'm, I'm pro herbal medicine pro secondary metabolites. And I'm not looking at plants as food. I'm looking at meat as food. I believe that the most important food for human beings is liver. Number two is red meat. Number three is white meat. And a lot of people don't think liver tastes good. Fine. You know, you can eat red meat and you can have some organ meats if you want. And then you can have, if you need some fiber, um, iceberg lettuce has the least amount of anti-nutrients. If you're lifting weights and you need some sugar in your blood and your muscles for a workout, eat some fruit, get the fructose in to increase the glycogen in your muscles and you might perform better. It's always an experiment. So, and there's some people who are carnivore for 20 years and I see their interviews on YouTube and they're doing perfectly fine. So, um, and I don't think the carnivore diet is for everybody. I I'm, I'm sure of that. And I don't recommend it for everybody. But what I recommend is that you take your diet, it's over here, and then bring it over here. And now come back to here, and then push it this way a little bit more. So swing your diet back and forth until you understand what your body needs at this point. And this has been, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years where I was vegan slash vegetarian in the mid 90s. I went back to the standard American diet. Then I went low carb. I was very strict with the low carb diet, less than 75 grams of carbs a day from 1999 to 2015. I saw how it was good for me and I saw how it wasn't good for me in certain ways. Then I went ketogenic. So I was doing um, very low carb, very, very low carb, less than 20 grams a day, and then raising it up to 150 to come out of ketosis. So now I'm going in and out of ketosis, raising and lowering my carbs. And I felt better. And then doing the carnivore diet, um, feel better even now than ever before. So that's my background. So what I just mentioned here, talks about the quantity of foods. And we've been discussing the quality of foods. I do have one more success story I want to share with you. I have a patient with um, acid reflex and GERD. She's doubly medicated, a very high dose of Nexium. And she can't sleep um, laying flat on her back. She has to sleep sitting upright. And she came to me and I gave her various supplements that I thought might work, some digestive support that didn't work. And after two months, I said to her on the phone, I said, look, you just have to stop eating plants. And she was somewhat upset about this. And she said, that's my favorite food. I love to have these big salads with all the colors of the rainbow. And I pour olive oil all over the salad and I love to eat it. And I said, yep, I understand but you have to stop that and then we'll see what happens. So just start eating meat. And that's what she did. And in one week, her GERD doubly medicated went from an eight out of 10 pain level to a two out of 10 in one week. Now that was a month ago. And every week she keeps getting better and better and better. I never say that a certain diet is for everybody, but I do think that 
ketosis is important for everybody to achieve, whether you do it from the ketogenic diet or just from not eating any food at all and fasting for five days, because uh, that's just so important to clean your body out. I think that's all I want to say. I have a ton of information that I could have gone over. I could have made this video three hours long, but I didn't. So thanks for opening up this discussion. I appreciate it. Thank you.